this morning. Thank you. And just follow, following up to that, the Associated Press reporting this morning, another Republican senator says she's open to a sweeping health care overhaul this year, Maine, Collin, Maine Senator Susan Collins. That's Neil Borofsky on your screen, the special administrator for the TARP Fund. He is today before the House Oversight Committee to testify on bonuses paid to executives at the insurance company AIG. Hearing about to get underway, the chairman is Adolphus Towns of New York. I would like to welcome a new member uh, to the committee. On the minority side, Representative Joseph Carr represents the second district of Louisiana. It's Cow, right? Carr, Cow? Gow, like Cow. Gow. 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 I'm happy you didn't hear me. After consultation uh, with the ranking member and pursuant to Committee Rule 8, I am assigning him to the Federal Workforce Committee. I welcome the gentleman and look forward to his contribution. And I yield to the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from uh, 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 California, California. <laughs> Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before we uh, start this important hearing, I think it is important to have our newest member seated. Uh, Representative Gao uh, asked for this committee, uh, competed for this committee, made the case for why uh, the things that, that happen in his home parishes in, in Louisiana are so critically related to this committee, and I agree with him. This committee, of course, after uh, Hurricane Katrina, certainly uh, has been down to his, his uh, district a lot. But more importantly, this is a member who has requested it because he believes that this committee has an important part in rooting out waste, fraud, and abuse in government. And, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd ask unanimous consent after the vote that he have a moment just to speak. Right. I, I'd like to yield to him two minutes at this time. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I like, would, would like to uh, thank the uh, ranking member uh, for the opportunity and I'll just Can, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you can speak directly into the mic, you know, yeah, right okay. into it, yes. You can tell I'm new to this committee here. Uh, but I'm losing my voice because of a cold that, I, that uh, I've been fighting. But um, but uh, I'm I'm very honored to be in this committee in order to serve to make sure that we, as a body, as a government, uh, work and function in a very effective and efficient manner. I know that after Hurricane Katrina, we experience um, tremendous amount of fraud and waste uh, down there at the district, and uh, one of the um, uh, messages that I campaigned on when I was running for U.S. Congress was to make sure that we operate uh, at the governmental level in a very ethical fashion. So I'm glad to be able to serve in this committee to make sure that everything that we do here uh, as a body to be transparent and to be, uh, and to be more and ethical. So with that, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. We're delighted to have you on the committee. Look forward to uh, working with you. This is a very active committee, and of course, uh, we're certain that you'll fit in well. Just over a year ago, just over a year ago, the United States economy lurched towards near ruin. Venerable financial institutions staggered towards collapse, and the market was in free fall. Americans were stunned as their savings disappeared overnight. The value of their homes plummeted, and their jobs disappeared. To save the economy from going from recession to depression, the federal government launched the largest bailout of private companies in history. America's leading financial firms were on life support 
when the Treasury Department injected them with hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. AIG, once the largest insurance company in America, became the single largest recipient of bailout dollars. AIG was the victim of one of its own divisions, AIG's financial products, which engage in the risky and unregulated trading that many blame for the company's collapse. The American taxpayers came to the rescue with an $85 billion bailout of AIG last September. That was followed by more money in October, more again in November, and still more in March of this year. In the end, the federal government had committed $180 billion to save AIG. Americans were justifiably outraged when they learned shortly thereafter that AIG was paying $165 million in bonuses to executives at the very division that caused the collapse of the company. But even that figure pales before what the Special Inspector General learned in the course of his audit, which he is releasing at our hearing today. Not long after the last administration had shoveled $85 billion into the failing giant, Federal Reserve officials learned that AIG's units planned to distribute a combined total of $1.7 billion in bonuses and other extraordinary compensation. That is the justification for giving bonuses to people who drove their own firm off a cliff and very nearly crashed the United States economy. Wasn't there something seriously out of whack here? This does not make a lot of sense to me. It turns out it wasn't always that way at AIG. The SIGTARP audit found that AIG's compensation used to be weighted towards long-term incentives that were payable only at retirement. In other words, they used the classic golden handcuffs. But in 2007, when losses began to mount, AIG knew management decided to update their compensation plans. The golden handcuffs were replaced by golden envelopes. The era of instant gratification had arrived at AIG. Long-term incentives were rejected in favor of short-term gains. Don't get me wrong, Americans don't resent people who make a lot of money. We all want to make a lot of money. But what infuriates people is when bosses at bailout companies, virtual awards of the state, continue to rake in millions. That's the problem. In effect, our millions, it just doesn't seem right that people who cause this tragedy should be so richly rewarded. You know, this is sort of unusual. Generally, when people are rewarded, it's the fact that they've done a fantastic job and they receive extra benefits for doing a great job. You're not generally rewarded when you're taking the company down the wrong road. Unfortunately, this is still very much an issue. AIG's current bonus proposal is under review by the Treasury Department's special master, Ken Feinberg. We will be hearing from Fein Mr. Feinberg two weeks from now at our second hearing on executive compensation. Today, we welcome back Special Inspector General Neil Borowski, who just completed his audit of AIG's compensation. Perhaps today we will shed additional light on what many American taxpayers are asking. Why didn't the federal government impose pay concessions on bailout companies? Why were huge bonuses paid to executives of firms that would now be in bankrupt but for a taxpayer bailout. How much more in lavish bonuses will the American taxpayers be required to foot? What have we learned about executive compensation and corporate performance from our experience with AIG? Again, I want to thank Mr. Borowski for appearing here today and for the outstanding work that he has done. At this point, I'd like to yield uh, five minutes to the committee's ranking member, Mr. Darrell Issa of San Diego, California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing on SIGTARP's audit today. 
I look forward to the Special IG's uh, testimony and his report. Mr. Chairman, I believe examining the Federal Government's role in AIG bonus is, an imp is important and it must be done by this committee. It is clear that this committee, having broad jurisdiction and the willingness to do oversight, cannot be discounted. As you might imagine, I would say that financial services should have helped prevent this and overseen it every day, step of the way, as should the New York Fed. But you will also find that today I am concerned that the era of political bankruptcies is just beginning. We certainly as a committee cannot continue to ignore vital issues, uh, and I will ask about these, related to the role of Freddie May, uh, Freddie May and Fannie, Fannie, I'm doing great, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, the bailouts of General Motors and Chrysler and the future of FHA, and I know this committee will not shrink from its duty. Last March, the American people learned that employees of AIG Financial Products, or FP, the very division responsible for making the bets that sank the company were getting hundreds of millions of dollars in retention payments for what ultimately had been their failure. AIG's CEO told us that the company needed to retain AIG FP employees because they had technical skills to unwind the company's risky investments in order to pay back the taxpayers. However, it is clear that it was not about paying back the taxpayers. In fact, during the so-called unwinding, that $180 billion, much of it went to paying 100 cents on the dollar for, in fact, uh, credit defaults or insurance programs, which would not have ordinarily in bankruptcy been paid full. And more important, the Treasury made a decision at the very time in which mark-to-market was on everyone's lips not to, in fact, purchase these these uh, uh, public, uh, sorry, these credit defaults at their market. You had pieces of paper which were floating around at a market rate of 20 or 30 cents on the dollar or more, and in fact, we paid 100 cents on the dollar. Many people do, he, during this hearing will probably not have realized that AIG was a conduit for paying Goldman Sachs and others billions of dollars on, at 100 cents on the dollar when, in fact, that paper would ordinarily have been discounted considerably, meaning permanently these people who got $168 million in retention bonuses were part of a larger uh, uh, political bankruptcy that led to the higher price being paid, in fact, 100 cents on the dollar, when in fact the market rate was a fraction of that. Mr. Chairman, I might point out this went on under the Bush administration. This is not something that this President did anything but inherit. And I hope that we will recognize that what we are doing here today is talking about a pattern of mistakes that I will characterize mostly as political bankruptcies being run by the government. The pattern of, of rewarding failure during the Bush administration, unfortunately, appears to continue during the current administration. Rather than learning from the mistakes of his predecessor, President Obama has entangled, in the, federal has entangled the federal bureaucracy across the private sector. Rather, rather than letting uh, failed companies fail through a bankruptcy system, we constantly are putting money in and then political influence. Mr. Chairman, General Motors was a political bankruptcy. Chrysler was a political bankruptcy. The American people and their kids and grandkids will pay the price. The lesson we ought to take from the story of AIG retention bonus today is rewarding failure through a policy of bailouts and circumventing the rule of law and ordinary uh, procedures within bankruptcy cost the taxpayers far more than if, in fact, we had backstopped what we were obligated to backstop if we had said to the bankruptcy uh, court, you determine what portion the federal government should pay and the American people will step up to the plate. However, no one, no one on either side of this dais for a moment believes that 100 cents on the dollar would have been what the American people would have paid. Tens of billions of dollars were paid out because this was a political bankruptcy and not handled by a federal judge as our law requires. So, Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence and yield back. 
Thank you, gentlemen, for his uh, opening statement. Anyone seeking recognition this time? Gentlemen from Maryland, Mr. Cummins is recognized for three minutes for the opening statement. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As I listened to Mr. Ice, I could not help but, th but rem remember, and I hope we don't get amnesia, that it was a Republican president that bought, and a Mr. Paulson, who was appointed by uh, President Bush, who came to this Congress uh, saying that the sky was falling. Come on, give me a break. And what this Congress did, and mainly Democrats trying to help this president get us out of this mess, was to do something that we did not like, to hold our nose and to address this issue the way we did. So let's not get amnesia here. The fact still remains is that we have a lot to do. AIG have, and I've said it many times, starting back in December of 2008, has not, had not been truly honest with the Congress of the United States of America. You know, I met with Mr. Liddy, uh, and I, after I read, wrote a letter to him, and he constantly told me, the former chairman, he constantly told me about bonuses, and every time he never gave us all the information. Back after my letter of December 1st, Mr. Liddy responded a few days later that it would be 168 employees receiving these payments in amounts between 160,000 and 4 million. Mr. Liddy and I then exchanged a series of letters and even sat down face to face to discuss the issue. And I explicitly asked that AIG be a good corporate citizen. Mr. Liddy assured me that AIG would be just that. Well, AIG cut off our communications and, and later we learned that upwards of 4,500 people, not 160 people, would be receiving bonuses and retention payments totaling over, as the chairman has already said, over $1 billion. Further, around 400 employees at the Financial Products Division, which is the very division that brought AIG down and brought, uh, brought the, the, the country down, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we found out that they were getting $450 million in so-called retention payments. The same financial products division that brought AG to his knees would be rewarding its traders reckless risk-taking with enormous corporate payouts to stick around and undo their handiwork. National unemployment was 8.5 percent when this happened. It stands to reason that there were, were very talented people out of work, traders on Wall Street, that might have been able to do this work without hundreds of millions of dollars in retention payments. Mr. Chairman, I see my time is running out, but I want to be very, very clear. I think we've done the best that we can do, and we're going to have to continue to be vigilant. Nobody likes what AIG did, and this report certainly does not shed a, a brilliant, uh, wonderful light uh, about what they did. And I want to thank you, Mr. Bobrovsky, for all that you've done, because you have presented yourself in a very forthright way, and we appreciate it, and we'll continue to work with you to try to make sure we get to the bottom of these bonuses and these junkets and whatever. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Maryland for his statement. Anyone on uh, seeking recognition? Real briefly. Whoops. Gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Real briefly, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'm glad you're holding uh, these hearings. I think it's extremely important that we uh, look into this very thoroughly. Uh, I think this uh, uh, should also include other issues of great significance and importance. There have been allegations that uh, there has been a, a, a special treatment given to some government officials regarding uh, uh, loans uh, countrywide. We had a hearing on that at some point uh, in the past. And during that hearing, uh, we asked uh, the uh, chairman of Countrywide a great many questions about preferential treatment. And uh, it's been in the papers a lot, and I hope and I know the chairman or by the ranking member shares our, our position on this. I hope that we will have a very thorough investigation of not just AIG but other things where there might have been some corruption. Anyone else seeking recognition? Yes, uh, gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And I think that uh, those, uh, those members who uh, are concerned about the conduct of people in the Senate or in the House, uh, we understand that the purpose of this committee, uh, government oversight, 
is to monitor the activities that are going on in the, in the private sector and in government. But the rules of the House require that the structure that's been set up by the House, which is the Ethics Committee, be used, and that this committee is not the appropriate place to start going after other members of Congress. Once we start that, we can't, what else are we going to do in this committee? The American people are relying on us to be able to try to straighten out this economy and to make Wall Street accountable. Now, whatever flaws members of Congress may have, and all of us do, I think that uh, the Ethics Committee is the appropriate uh, venue for those, and people have complaints to bring, they ought to do that. But to keep trying to bring it up in this committee to uh, challenge the conduct of other members of Congress, be they in the House or the Senate, what, what the gentleman I, think, I, I think actually uh, what it does is it, uh, it slows the momentum that we need to build by uh, bipartisan. With the gentleman we need to build to be able to uh, accomplish the goals of this uh, of this committee. Would my uh, colleague this, yield? This, this, I will in a minute. This committee uh, has to deal with over 13 trillion dollars in spending that's been put out there by the Treasury and by the Fed. And and I think the, my my colleagues on the other side certainly know that I haven't pulled any punches when it's come to the administration at all. Nor will I. Will not. But come on, we can't use this committee to snipe at each other all the time. We've got to focus, keep our eye on the ball. And I'm glad we're having a hearing on AIG's bonuses. But we need to go a lot deeper. Well, will the gentleman yield? I'll yield. Uh, what I said in my remarks was that there have been allegations that some government officials, I didn't spent, mention members of Congress, some government officials may have uh, gotten preferential treatment from places like Countrywide. And when I was chairman, we followed it where it led for six years. And so, you know, I'm not talking about congressmen, but I am talking about people in government who have very high positions who may have got preferential treatment in order to do things. And uh, uh, I think we need to investigate that. Yeah, I don't know that it's going to in, 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 mean, I don't know that time. it's going to mean members of Congress. Reclaiming we'll my see. time, I want to say that, uh, uh, you know, there were some investigations that Mr. Burton had when he was chairman, uh, Mr. Burton, that, that I supported. And, you know, I, and, and I, I just, but the, but the one thing I thought was important when, when you were chairman, it's important when Mr. Towns is chairman, is that, look, um, yeah, we're, we follow investigations wherever we lead. But if uh, someone wants to imply expressly or otherwise uh, that there's people that we have to start our look at within the Congress of the United States, I say that's what the Ethics uh, Committee is all about. And, Would the gentleman yield? And, and I, you know, I, my time's expired, but I think that, Gentleman's you know, time. we're going we're to put this on the table here and either put it to rest or this committee is going to end up becoming an armed camp going against each other. I don't think we need to do that. Let's keep our eye on the ball. Let's challenge Wall Street. Let's Mr. Borofsky get a chance to tell us what he's found and uh, make these firms on Wall Street accountable. And if there's anybody in the government holding hands with them, you know, let's look at them, too. The gentleman's time has expired. <clears throat> Mr. Michael, Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me just say for the record, um, I've heard, you know, uh, again, we hear blame it on Bush. Uh, I think our ranking member <laughs> did indicate that we, uh, some of the crises uh, did start during the Bush administration. Uh, the TARP was created uh, partially under the Bush administration. And, at least half of the funds were left to the current administration. I believe if we just look at what we're doing here today, uh, we're looking at the distribution on Friday, March 13, 2009, that's this year, this administration, uh, when AIG began distributing $165 million, and that's, uh, that's when uh, we had a significant amount of uh, TARP money into this. And we're here to, uh, today to hear report of a special inspector general uh, on that money uh, from that account in this year. So uh, that's why we're here. Uh, people had their hands in the cookie jar uh, during this administration. And uh, we need to find out what took place and how the taxpayer once, ag uh, once again got ripped off. And this $165 million is, uh, is only uh, part of nearly two-thirds of a billion dollars of bonuses that I want to hear about uh, that were used or abused or misused by AIG. I'd like to yield to uh, our ranking member, if I may. I thank the gentleman. 
And uh, for my uh, friend and colleague from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, please understand that our request to continue on the countrywide investigation recognizes that, first of all, the Senate Ethics Committee has made it clear that the recipients on the Senate side that are known about committed no ethical violations as recipients. Uh, that clearing is a clearing very narrowly of the, of the recipients, not of the company that clearly was spending millions of dollars through a discount program to curry favor. I have offered the, uh, the chairman and would reiterate the offer to the chairman that we could redact any, any, and I repeat, any and all loans related to members of Congress, and I would happily investigate the question of what did they want to, to, uh, to do with Franklin Raines? What did they want to do with the Postmaster General? What did they want to do with a key Republican staffer on the Financial Services Committee to provide VIP loans? Not what did those people do in return. What I'm most concerned is what did Countrywide want? And if possible, what did they get? But most importantly, what did they want? For the chairman's uh, uh, and the uh, subcommittee chairman's edification, please understand, Mr. Kucinich, I have been told that no laws were violated under existing statutes by Countrywide. That begs the question for the American people, should there have been a law? And if there isn't a law, don't we have an obligation to say, do we want to have corporate America providing in secret millions of dollars in discounts to high-ranking government officials in the future? Because if we do nothing, then the status quo is it's ethically and legally allowed. You'll the gentleman's time from Florida has expired. Anyone else? Can, gentleman from California. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. This is a very uh, important and significant hearing. Uh, I'm going to take my full five minutes, but I'd like to yield no, no, a minute. No, it's three minutes, Matt. <laughs> three minutes. Okay. I'd like to uh, yield a minute to uh, Mr. Kucinich. I, I want to thank the gentle lady just to respond to my colleague, and that is that, uh, look, I don't hold any brief for anybody who's doing anything wrong, especially members of Congress. But we better be careful about using our positions to promote innuendo, or to uh, inadvertently smear someone else's name. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. At the beginning of uh, 2008. The gentleman from California has the time. At the beginning of 2008, AIG was the world's largest insurance company with operations in 130 countries and more than $1 trillion in assets. Yet by the end of 2008, AIG was relying on $150 billion in federal money for survival as a result of the complex derivatives being peddled in their financial products division. Despite the fact that it was the self-destructive business practices driven by short-term gain rather than long-term uh, sustainability of the financial products division, which resulted in the government owing 79.9 percent of the business, it was revealed in March that these same employees would be receiving $165 million in so-called retention bonuses. I don't understand if you are doing your job and you do it satisfactorily, why do you have to have a bonus? You are being paid for doing your job. So this revelation has rightly stoked outrage on behalf of the American taxpaying public. In this recession, Americans outside of Wall Street have seen their jobs, their savings, and their sense of security diminished, while those responsible for the reckless business practices that led to the crisis receive rescue funds from the government and bonuses completely unrelated to the market performance of their employer or the actual caliber of their work. I sincerely hope and I want to thank our uh, witness that we will have the necessary information. This is the Oversight Committee and we need to be watching with a close eye to how we handle taxpayers' money and I am very, very pleased that we have this opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to hear from uh, our witness. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the gentlewoman from California for her statement. Anyone seeking record? Uh, uh, Congressman Henry McHenry from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield my time to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just for the record, uh, if we look at AIG going into uh, the pre bankruptcy period, uh, it is commonly stated that they had over a trillion dollars in assets. Reviewing the June 2008 financials, what you discover is to get a trillion dollars, you have almost $400 billion worth of the value of, of bonds that haven't been sa sold. So, uh, you know, if you've ever had a kited uh, value uh, on a balance sheet, it's when you say you've got a trillion, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, a trillion, but then you have $400 billion worth of, of assets that are basically if somebody would buy my bonds. And uh, that's, that's uh, probably more telling of the fact that uh, the underlying assets were going to go down, but that asset was already effectively zero unless somebody wanted to pay for it. And uh, uh, further, uh, because there was a further comment by uh, Mr. Kucinich, let's understand that if, in fact, because there was a member of Congress, two senators actually involved in receiving uh, countrywide loans, if that is our basis to say it is innuendo if we want to go after an organization that dumped onto the American people not billions but trillions in total and has cost the American people hundreds of billions of dollars worth of losses because of their action in coordination with the GSEs, then I think we miss the whole point of how can we say we can't go there? Uh, this, this side of the aisle certainly would be more than happy to do any and all limitations in the documents so that we were not looking at members of Congress but looking only at countrywide. But today there are boxes of documents sitting at Bank of America, which Bank of America said they would like to give us, but for reasons of not being sued by individuals involved in that whose names uh, would be on it, they wanted to have a subpoena, and yet we won't give one. And I might mention that this committee asked and received the same company, Bank of America, an, a waiver on attorney-client privilege in order to get the full facts related to Merrill Lynch. If we can not only subpoena, but demand and, and, and negotiate a waiver of attorney-client privilege, how could we not at least look at the documents related to what did now B of A, but then countrywide individuals attempt to do to influence government actions that led to hundreds of billions of dollars of loss to the American people. And I yield back. Gentlemen, time, gentlemen from North Carolina. Anyone else seeking recognition? Let me just say to, uh, before we move forward, um, to the gentleman from uh, California, and of course, that this is not a super uh, ethics committee. Uh, we, uh, the ethics committee has its role and its function, and, and I think they'll do a good job, but uh, I don't see in terms of this committee. And I must say that uh, uh, to the gentleman who served here as a chair of this committee, which and I must admit I enjoyed working with them, he may probably set a record in terms of the amount of subpoenas that he issued. But he did not subpoena anybody from the Congress. And I think we need to just think about it. Let's put it all in, in the proper perspective so we can move forward. And let's not lose sight on the bigger picture. We're talking about uh, companies that received TARP money, government money, and then just sort of like gave it to people who really didn't perform well. And then when it was questioned, they said it's retention. Why would you keep somebody that's not performing well? You wouldn't do it on your staff. So on that note, I yield back. Yes, you gentleman from Massachusetts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I came here today to talk about AIG, and I assume that we'll listen to Mr. Borofsky in a minute to hear about AIG, and I appreciate the work that he's done. Uh, but I also think that this committee uh, ought to be cautious about using uh, this committee as a platform to go after other members. That's what the Ethics Committee is about if there's a question about the conduct of other members. And that we, we you know, sometimes we on this side are in the majority, sometimes you on the other side are in the majority. So we have to be careful from our respective positions about setting a precedent here that would uh, 
inevitably lead to calls in the future to, uh, uh, to issue subpoenas for other House members that are involved in uh, similar controversies. Got, got to realize we're setting a precedent with what we do here. And, and I just ask my friends, and you are my friends on both sides of the aisle, to, to be cautious about what you're advocating here because uh, um, if we want to start subpoenaing mortgage records in an investigation that deals with uh, improper influence, we want to start you know, subpoenaing mortgage records of members of Congress, if this committee does that, it doesn't leave that up to ethics, uh, then what's to stop us from subpoenaing financial contributions and to start asking people to give testimony under oath about the financial contributions that they got from certain interests. This is why. This is not, the, this is not what the work that this committee ought to be doing. We start investigating each other, and I assume there'd be a lot of opportunities that we could all have doing that. We wouldn't be doing anything else. It'd just be a partisan morass. So let's, let's lift our eyes a little bit higher than that. That's not in any way to dismiss the gravity of any improper conduct anywhere by anyone, but it's to say that we create a, a structure in our system here to deal with questions about the conduct of members of Congress. And uh, if, there, if there's a problem and that structure isn't working properly, then members of Congress have to account for that and we have to make it work. But we can't be using this committee uh, for uh, the purposes of trying to uh, bring down uh, uh, each other. Just not, just not right. So, Mr. Borowski, uh, today we're going to talk about AIG, I assume. And we're going to talk about uh, the bonuses and what we can do to stop uh, a practice from uh, when the American people gave all this money out to make sure that their money isn't being misspent. So I thank you for being here. I just want to say welcome. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. And I, Fortenberry, 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 Nebraska. Yield three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield as much time as he'd like to consume to Mr. Isa. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Kucinich, you're my friend and fellow Clevelander, and I would hope that what I say now you hear so that you don't have to give an answer that is completely off what I've said previously again. I am perfectly willing to have the subpoena include no members of Congress, none, none of their records, none of their mortgages. This is not about members of Congress, the House or the Senate. The Senate Ethics Committee has already spoken that there was no violation for receiving these by two senators. We don't need to look further. That has been done. However, I hope the gentleman will realize that Countrywide did this for a reason. Countrywide individuals, including a whistleblower, have already told us that they intended to influence for the benefit of Countrywide and its ability to, now we know, put toxic loans onto the books of the GSEs. That is, in fact, what happened. So, Mr. Borofsky, I appreciate your indulgence. It is very clear that that's not what this hearing is about today. But on Thursday, when I request a subpoena, which I've noticed the chairman, I would hope that everybody would allow for a straight up or down vote on the merits of the request for subpoena. That request will be narrow. We do not want to investigate members of Congress. Other committees may do that. What we want to do is we want to know what was it that internal memos and, and documents related to other, mem other people in and out of government, what were they trying to achieve? Why did they give tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of discount to a broad array of people? We are not interested in the people they didn't want influence from, and we're not interested in members of Congress. And I might say, when we're saying on this side of the aisle, we don't want anything to do with the members of Congress, we're more than happy to look toward Countrywide, because Countrywide is the organization that has led more than any other single organization to the loss of billions of dollars of American taxpayer money. So although Mr. Borofsky can do a good job 
cleaning up after the flood and trying to deal with the, uh, the liquidity of, of the market and so on, we have an obligation to make sure this never happens again. And this will happen again if corporate America is allowed to bribe people around government in order to get them either to do things for them or in this case turn a blind eye to billions of dollars, tens and hundreds of billions of dollars of toxic loans being put onto the backs of the American people through these GSEs which had the full faith and credit of the American people. That's what it's about. And it's more important to, that we make sure it doesn't happen again than in fact whether $165 million went to a group of people who are now unemployed. That is what we're here, we're here talking about. And Mr. Kucinich, you're my friend. I hope you hear this time. I do not want in this subpoena to ask for anything related to members of Congress, but I cannot allow this to continue, us seeing no evil when in fact we know there was evil. And yield back. Right. Moving forward, we'll turn now to the sole witness, Mr. Neil Borowski, the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program whose office has just completed an audit of the hundreds of millions of dollars of retention bonuses AIG has already paid and the millions more it expects to pay. It is committee policy uh, that we swear in all of our witnesses. So will you please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. I'll ask all, actually, uh, let me just say that uh, you know the rules. Uh, we generally give you five minutes, but we want to give you ten. And then, of course, then go into questions and answers, because we think your report is just so valuable that you need additional time. So uh, ten minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to, I'll try to stay under that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Rice, uh, members of the committee, uh, it is a privilege and honor to return to testify before this committee and discuss with you today the audit that we released this morning uh, into the circumstances surrounding AIG financial products uh, payment of approximately $168 million in retention bonuses to more than 400 employees earlier this year. Last fall, policy decisions were made by uh, the policymakers at Treasury and the Federal Reserve that is a failure of AIG would have such a high systemic cost that it was worth the unprecedented bailout and use of taxpayer dollars to save that company. Federal Reserve went first. In September, uh, gave a line of credit of $85 billion to AIG and followed that by sending teams in to take a close, long, hard look at AIG's executive compensation structure. What they found was a mess. More than 600 <coughs> different programs, some entitled bonuses, some <coughs> deferred compensation, some retention plans uh, affecting more than 50,000 employees, programs so diverse and uh, decentralized that AIG senior executives themselves weren't involved in the approval of many of these plans and didn't have a full sense of what they were. A mess so sprawling that even as we concluded our audit late this summer, federal uh, executives at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, at AIG, and the Fed's consultants still did not have their arms wrapped around the entire AIG executive compensation structure. The Fed, and by the Fed I'm, I'm referring to uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, um, looked at executive compensation from its unique perspective. It looked at the amount of money involved and concerned whether bleeding of, of, of cash would impact AIG's ability to repay its loan. They looked to see whether the structure had perverse incentives that would encourage executives to take decisions, make decisions that would be not in the best interest of the company and most importantly from the Fed's perspective, inhibit the ability to repay the loan. Treasury, on the other hand, paid scant attention to the executive compensation structure. Other than, than discovering and figuring out who the 50 or so employees that would be subject to its executive compensation uh, restrictions that were included in the November $40 billion TARP bailout, Treasury did little more. As a result, when the March 2009, earlier this year, AIG financial products retention payments came, came through, Treasury didn't know about them until two weeks beforehand. And they didn't know the scope of those, those payments, that they were going to apply not just to essential personnel, but also to non-essential, people who worked in the mail room, in the kitchen, in the file room. Our audit in this concludes that this was a failure. 
It was a failure of oversight by Treasury, which essentially abdicated its role in, in favor of allowing the Federal Reserve, notwithstanding the fact that the Fed had different interests and different concerns in Treasury, as reflected perhaps uh, most clearly by the fact that its agreement with, with AIG included no provisions relating to executive compensation. Our audit also concludes that Secretary Geithner did not find out, did not learn of these bonus payments until just days before they were made. But this, too, is a failure. It was a failure of communications and it was a failure of management. Exec executives and senior officials at, at FRBNY knew about these, these bonus payments back in the fall of 2008 when Secretary Geithner was then president of FRBNY, but none of them uh, alerted him or elevated this issue, according to our audit's findings, notwithstanding the explosive nature and controversial nature of the payments. At Treasury, they didn't find out until two weeks before, but even then it took them 10 days to elevate this issue to the Secretary's level, even though the Fed had warned them when they notified them about the size of these payments of the intense press and congressional concern about them and said in their words that they were not going to be easy for Treasury and Fed to defend. Based on these failings, our audit contained three recommendations. First, when we were conducting our audit, we learned that the special master, Kenneth Feinberg, while doing his evaluation of AIG's executive compensation, hadn't been in touch with FRBNY officials, even though they've spent better part of a year studying AIG's executive compensation and spent a lot of resources on hiring a consultant. We made a recommendation, and after receiving a draft version of this report, we've been informed that Treasury has adopted this recommendation, and Mr. Feinberg is now dealing with his counterparts at the FRBNY. We also make two recommendations looking forward. First, that in the future, if Treasury is going to be making this type of investment, this type of bailout of a company, then have policies in place to make sure that there is going to be a comprehensive and not ad hoc review of the executive compensation and other politically sensitive issues so that they know in advance when these, when these issues are lurking around the corner. And second, to the extent that Treasury continues to rely on other Federal agencies or other entities to conduct its compliance for it, to outsource its oversight, that it do so with policies in place, a plan in place. For if there is anything that we have learned from this audit and the circumstances of March of this year, a failure to give clear directions and clear, have a clear communication protocol with, this, with an oversight entity that is doing the oversight for you is a recipe for the disastrous consequences and results that we saw earlier this year. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, uh, that concludes my, my opening statement today and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Right, thank you very much uh, for your statement and thank you for the work that you have done. You have done a superb job and we thank you for it. Um, let me begin by saying AIG is now proposing to pay another $198 million in bonuses. So we have history repeating itself. Shouldn't those bonuses be reduced given the poor performance of the company? I think these are exactly the issues that, that the, Mr. Feinberg is now grappling with, uh, is looking at um, these bonus payments, not just within respect of financial products, but in, in the overall picture of AIG's bonus situation. Uh, there is an opportunity that is here because of the advanced knowledge that really didn't exist last time because it took so long for senior officials at Treasury to know about them until just days beforehand. Uh, but I think that's a very important, those are very important considerations that are going to be addressed. Yeah. Now, I know um, after the media got into the situation that uh, last year, uh, well, during the spring, um, the uproar over AIG's bonuses, AIG announced that its executives had agreed to return $45 million. How much of that really was collected? As of the conclusion of our audit field work in August, it was $19 million had been collected. Less than 50 percent, huh? Less than 50 percent. If I read your report correctly, some of these executives are refusing to give back the money uh, unless they can get commitment that they are going to get the bonus the next year. So they are holding it in ransom. Uh, I think it it's, was described to us as a wait and see attitude. They want to see what, what they are going to be getting uh, after Mr. Feinberg conducts his review of the $198 million uh, next March uh, before they commit or fulfill their commitment to, to pay back the bonuses. I think that is correct. What about those that left the company? Uh, AI AIG has noted that it will be difficult for them to uh, enforce collecting the money for those that have left the company. You know, the media has focused on the 
$165 million of bonuses AIG paid out in March. But isn't it true that shortly after the AIG bailout last September, the Federal Reserve learned that AIG had planned to pay over $1.7 billion in bonuses and retention plans? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Across all the different programs of the uh, affecting approximately 50,000 AIG employees worldwide, uh, that is the, the approximate number. And I say it is an approximate number because, as I mentioned, even today uh, they still do not have, or at least as we conclude our auto work, they still do not have their arms wrapped around all the various AIG bonus and retention and deferred compensation structures. Right. Why didn't the last administration extract any bonus concessions out of AIG in return for the $85 billion bailout? Well, the Federal Reserve put, put no restrictions in. Uh, they view themselves as a creditor. Uh, as opposed to, to, to having made an investment. Uh, and the only provision in their agreements related to corp general governance issues, which is what they use to take a look at, uh, at AIG's bonus structure and, and why they focus on issues related to paying back money. And this is one of the criticisms of our report. When Treasury outsourced its, its oversight to the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve had a far different interest and approach to executive compensation than what Treasury had to do as on behalf of the, of the government people. So their, their concerns were based on, on getting money to pay back the loan, but didn't focus on the issues that this Congress, when it enacted the TARP, required Treasury to consider when, make, when using TARP funds. Right. Is it true that AIG's management still does not have a complete picture of AIG's different bonus and retention obligations? Did AIG ever really know where all the money was going? As of the time we concluded our audit work, that is, that is correct. They did not know. Um, this was an incredibly decentralized system. It was, as, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, a mess. Right. Now, I know Treasury and the uh, New York Feds have been on the ground for months at AIG. Have they taken any steps to address this problem? They, the Federal Reserve, I mean, to its credit, when it, when it came in in September, recognized what a mess it was, and they, they hired an outside consultant, uh, Ernst & Young, who has assisted them in, in getting their arms wrapped around these programs. Um, some of the, the basic data took five or six months to, to pull out of human resources. Um, so they have been making an effort and have committed resources, but the, the, the task is such an enormous one. Uh, but they have been trying to get their arms wrapped around these issues. Right. Is it fair to say, based on your audit, that there is a breakdown in communications between Treasury, of course, and the Federal Reserve regarding AIG's plan? I think that would be kind to, to have it as a breakdown. I think that they were, they were essentially, after Treasury invested the $40 billion, communications were virtually nonexistent. Right. And then I think my final question before I yield, uh, are Treasury's pay restrictions truly enforceable? How hard would it be if for TARP, tarp to uh, recipients to circumvent the bonus restrictions? If well, they just said we're not going to do it and start looking for ways and methods. It's particularly difficult with agreements like this that are that were executed prior to February 11, 2009, which is which is the cutoff date um, in uh, in ARA, which which set forth these restrictions. But on the flip side. We have to remember that we are also, with respect to AIG, we own 80 percent of the company. Uh, and that I think sometimes it is important for the Federal Government uh, to recognize the leverage that is associated with having such a significant ownership interest uh, when seeking to renegotiate these payments. Right. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have called this a political bankruptcy, and I stand by that. Had a genuine bankruptcy occurred, isn't it true that all these contracts would have been immediately void or voidable? Um, Mr. Jackson, I'm not a, uh, a bankruptcy expert, so I, I'm not sure. But hey, has someone mentioned that to you at some yeah, point? Yeah, no, no. I, I, I don't want to be definitively, but I am. I'm. I'm pretty okay. sure that a bankruptcy would certainly impact those types of contractual obligations. Uh, you know, I fly United Airlines back and forth every week, so I I sit and stand with the flight attendants who who watch their obligation for their pension be shut off the day they went into bankruptcy and what they got was pennies on the dollar. So I am very familiar in that sense with uh, how broad bankruptcy can, can be, even if I hadn't had to deal with it in my own business life. Uh, but go forward, looking forward, the Special Master, Mr. Feinberg, 
he is going to make these decisions, the pays are, if you will. Are you going to have full access and oversight as the IG of his decision process? Uh, absolutely. That is that's clearly within our jurisdiction. The next time we have you back, or if in an interim report, if you can, can you do us a favor, I believe, on both sides of the aisle, and de-aggregate, if you will, 180, 165 million and all these numbers, and give us the amount that would be fair and reasonable that should be paid, that would be paid, if you will, in somebody else's opinion, or, and or the amount of people whose, whose uh, bonuses are not in question. And I, and I bring this up for a moment. I, I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't have done a better job. As a matter of fact, the second half of what I'm going to ask is very much about that. But isn't it true that $165 million, some of those people should have gotten what they got? And some of those people got relatively small bonuses uh, compared to others. Isn't that true? I think that's a, it's a difficult question to answer because of the, the, the policy implications. As, as you noted, if there was a bankruptcy, it's likely that none of these people would have received any bonuses. Um, and at what the value of these individuals is really beyond the scope of our, our work. So it would be well, tough, difficult for me to answer that question. Okay. Well, hopefully you will be able to do it in some future time. Would you also, uh, every time we get a report, give us the base pay of the individuals relative to bonus? so that we know over the covered period how much they made in pay. In other words, if you pay a billion dollars in salaries and you have 165 million in bonuses, you have 16.5 percent bonus. On the other hand, if you pay 100 million in pay, base pay and 165 million in bonuses, you got 165 percent. We need to know that. I think it is going to help this committee understand or at least the American people understand the magnitude. Because I, I believe up until now we have been dealing with these, first of all, small numbers compared to the trillions that are still floating around in the risk pool. And we probably have been stepping on some individuals who simply sort of the janitor's bonus for, for not leaving uh, uh, and letting the toilets back up. You know, perhaps we should, uh, we should look at those as not all equal. Let me go to one other question, though, because, you know, when you talked about abrogating uh, responsibility to the, to the Fed, you really abrogated it, or I'm sorry, we re abrogated, abrogated it as the government uh, through Treasury to Mr. Geithner. Isn't that true? He was the president of FRBNY at this time, yes. Okay. And the question for us here today is what did he know and when did he know it and why didn't he know it? If today he's the Treasury Secretary, was he inept? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a quick set of questions for you. Uh, my understanding is your investigation only went up to uh, the senior vice president, probably AIG relation, uh, uh, relationship monitoring. That would be the highest level that was interviewed. Is that roughly right? Um, as far as interviews are concerned, I know we did talk to the senior vice president level, but uh, I also personally spoke to with, with higher ranking members at, 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 at FRBNY. Okay. So if the senior vice president in the area that we think over risk management would have been the person to talk to. Uh, if the, above that you have an executive vice, vice president, today it is Sandy Kruger. Uh, above that you have a first vice president, today it is uh, Christine Cummings. Above that you have a president. And of course above that you have the board of directors and the chairman of the board. And above that you had Tim Geithner. How do we know today that no one in that chain knew we assume many of them did, and that none of them talked to Mr. Geithner. In other words, when your opening statement, you said, well, uh, the Fed didn't know. Well, how do we know they didn't know if these individuals haven't been personally interviewed uh, to find out if they spoke to anyone at the Fed, uh, including Federal Reserve Bank of New York, including Mr. Geithner? When we, we do our review, we obviously we request a, a broad range of documents. We ask to speak to a broad range of people. We ask to be identified. The, the, a broad range of people. And, and in this audit, like all our audits, we talk to folks, senior people at the Federal Reserve, as well as at Treasury, as well as at AIG. And one of the questions that we asked was, was communications up into the, the then President and current Secretary, uh, Mr. Geithner. Um, we review those documents. We talk to a number of individuals. We talk to the individuals that we think are necessary. Um, as far as Secretary himself, uh, he has publicly made statements uh, about the, the time of his knowledge. And we saw nothing in our report or in our interviews that would indicate that, that he was, was not being truthful. From our perspective, this is a significant failing in management. But I also think it is important to note, and this is sort of what gets to one of our recommendations, is that the Federal Reserve 
did not view until very recently, I mean, until recently <coughs> before the payments were made, didn't really view these as much being of, of a big deal. Uh, they were looking at this purely from a dollars and cents perspective of $168 million, which while significant, was a drop in the bucket compared to their overarching concern, which was paying back the debt. They were not concerned. And that's the problem about Treasury outsourcing this. Because while Treasury may have been and would be required to have been more sensitive to these issues, the Federal Reserve was looking at this from a creditor, and $168 million from a creditor's perspective just wasn't that much of a concern. So I am confident that my audit team did, took the steps that were necessary to answer that question. It's a question that I, I wanted them to answer about when, when Mr. Geithner became aware of this. Um, and I would also like to note that we, we share our information and uh, drafts of this audit report, and we check in both formally and informally to make sure that we have our facts right. There is nothing that could prevent individual officials at the Federal Reserve from lying to us. There is nothing that could prevent them from withholding documents that we requested. But we saw no indication of any of those things occurring. Uh, and I, I stand by my audit team's work on this in, uh, in their belief that we didn't see anything that indicated that he knew before, before March 10th. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Borowski. You um, talked uh, during your opening statement about this um, failure to communicate somewhere between Treasury and, um, and, and um, the Federal Reserve. Who is dropping the ball there? I guess what I am trying to do is trying to figure out how do we make sure that, that there is communication that, that needs to happen. I mean, so how would you remedy that? You, I looked at your recommendations and you seem to talk about a plan, but I am just, what's your, what, how, how do you think we ought to try to deal with that? I think the issue is that once a decision was made that the Federal Reserve was going to take the lead of doing oversight uh, and, and doing compliance, there, there wasn't any, any protocol established. There wasn't any communication. Well, what types of things are we interested? What types of things were we looking at? Whether it was because of a lack of resources or a lack of commitment, uh, the Fed was sort of left off to, it, to its own. And what we, what we recommend is to learn the lesson here and establish, the, first of all, in any extent possible, Treasury should directly be involved in providing oversight uh, when it is TARP money. This is Treasury's responsibility ultimately. But in those circumstances where it is decided to outsource, there has to be established plans, policies and procedures. There has, Treasury needs to identify for the Federal Reserve what the issues that it wants it to follow up on, and then they have to maintain and follow up, set, set guideposts, set milestones, uh, make it a priority to have that level of communication. Uh, I think ultimately it, it's, it, it's difficult to assign blame squarely on one entity or the other, but, but ultimately it was Treasury's responsibility to provide oversight for, that, for the first $40 billion. Now, in, in my discussions and letters with Mr. Liddy, exchange of letters with Mr. Liddy, the former CEO, um, he used all kinds of terms like um, retention payments, bonus payments, One of, uh, and, and he didn't use these words, but he did say that they needed to keep certain employees for winding down. They were the only people that could wind down. Uh, and it seems like it was all kinds of reasons why they were keeping these folks. But then when I see that we have got an unemployment rate of 8.5 and we are supposed, uh, supposed to believe that AIG would not have been able to replace, and I do have a lot of empathy for uh, kitchen assistants and mailroom assistants uh, getting $7,000 bonuses. Uh, and are we supposed to believe that AIG financial products could have unwound the problem trades without so-called crucial employees retaining them? I'm talking about for big, big money. It's not that you, as you know, it was not lightweight bonuses. These people got some nice, nice, nice funds. So, I mean, did you, in your research, did you find, you know, uh, that there was a need to keep folks on? And it seems like there's such a wide range of folks who were getting bonuses. And when you get down to the mailroom, when you've got millions upon millions of people unemployed in our country, you have to wonder. Uh, Congressman, I, I think you're absolutely accurate. I don't think that it's, it's defensible to suggest that um, if AIG did not pay a retention payment to a, a mailroom employee or a kitchen assistant, that that employee A would, would necessarily leave. And if that employee left, 
uh, whether it would be difficult to, to replace that position given the state of the economy. But I also think that the second, the first part of your statement, um, this also is a problem with transparency. And I, too, was left with the impression after the hearings and, and all the public announcements that these payments were going to those who were necessary and involved to unwind these complex transactions. Uh, and it was one of, one of the things that surprised me the most as I saw the audit work come in, that this was essentially to every single employee at Financial Products. Um, and here the, the failure of transparency um, goes to the, what we were discussing just a moment ago. The fact that Treasury had outsourced this and wasn't aware of this information meant that it couldn't be transparent about these payments because they didn't have that knowledge. And as I have discussed in other uh, reports and I will be discussing in my quarterly report, which I will be discussing with this committee next week, um, there is a cumulative effect from these, these failures of transparency. Yeah, no doubt about it. And the, the question becomes, um, I think AIG was disingenuous at, at best and outright deceptive at worst. Um, because I'm going to tell you, uh, based upon all the communications I got, um, and then to find out the, this kind of information, what that means is somebody simply was not telling the truth. And I think that's why the American people uh, got so upset about this and will get even more upset because they feel that they have been, you know, they, they think they're doing one thing, but yet and still they're losing their houses, their homes, their savings, and, and everything, while other people are getting these bonuses and, and saying that they're supposed to be retention payments, when really a lot of these people did not fit that category. I, I, think, I think so. And uh, I would throw one other possibility in there, which is just incompetence. Um, the list that we received that, that put the, the, the positions with the, uh, with the bonus payments, um, that was something AIG had to create. Uh, it wasn't a document that existed beforehand that they created in response to our audit. So it may be that we were the first person to even ask the question of, of who were the people who actually got these bonuses and what their, what their jobs were. Um, but but I, don't know, I don't know which category it fits within. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple of questions, then I'll yield to uh, Mr. Issa. Uh, Mr. Issa mentioned uh, that uh, it would have been better, in many of our opinions, if uh, we had let all these uh, problems go through the regular bankruptcy procedures. But uh, there were decisions made by the uh, administrations to bail out a number of these companies. When the bailout procedures took place, there evidently was no provisions put in those agreements that said that uh, since the government is loaning that money or spending that money to buy stock in those companies, that uh, the government has the right to review the bonus procedures, was there? Oh, no, absolutely not. There were very limited circumstances uh, for a limited number of employees. Now, in the event that, and there's a lot of people that believe we're not out of the woods yet as far as the economy is concerned, in the event that uh, this comes up again in the not too distant future and uh, we don't go down the bankruptcy court route, uh, could we put in those agreements, if the government is bailing out an industry, could we put in those agreements a specific uh, uh, language that would say that the government has to review and approve any bonuses before they are given? It certainly would be a possibility. Yeah. Well, that is the one thing I would like to point out. That seems to me, I was not for the bailouts, did not vote for them, but it seems to me if we were going to do that and we were going to use tax taxpayers' money, we certainly should have had provisions in there that controlled the way that money was going to be spent because it was taxpayers' money. And when you talk about these huge bonuses, it seems to me they could have put a lid on some of that. So, um, but we should have gone through the bankruptcy procedure, in my opinion. With that, uh, let me yield to my colleague. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, I want to ask from this side of the aisle, because I think your answer was good and I want to make sure both sides have asked it. If I understand correctly, you said everyone got a bonus. And clearly, in your opinion, not everyone needed to get a bonus in order to be retained. Or if they weren't retained because they didn't get a bonus, they could have been replaced, including, as Mr. Cummings, I think, alluded to, you know, basic clerical personnel who had no special skills. Is that correct? I do believe that. So very clearly somebody who made the decision to, uh, uh, to give these bonuses made a decision that was in the best interest of making everyone happy and not the best interest of the American taxpayers or even AIG. Is that correct? I think that w at the time these contracts were, were entered into, it was before the government bailout, but ultimately 
yes, the decision was made not to try to renegotiate these payments and go forward with them. That is correct. Okay. Uh, I want to go back down uh, a track for a moment. You made a decision not to speak or speak directly with some people in the chain of command who may have talked to somebody at, uh, at the New York Fed about these bonuses prior to the document production. Uh, and, I, and I know you said sometimes people withhold documents, but if I understand correctly, individual members of the board, the pres then president, the vice, first vice president, and the uh, executive vice president may not have been asked at, uh, they were in place at that time, did you speak to anyone at the Fed or even at Treasury about these bonuses prior to the date you currently know of? Is that correct? Um, I don't have the, the exact list of, of people that my audit team uh, interviewed. Uh, however, again, I think we've, we followed this information uh, to, to its appropriate conclusion. Okay. Those well, who then, then can I ask that as a supplemental, and I'll, I'll put it in writing if you need it, but uh, that each of these individuals who were in place at that time be asked what did you know, when did you know it, and who did you tell? That each of those people, if they haven't been asked personally, not document production, but personally, if they knew about it and or if they spoke to anyone at the Fed, if each of these people could be interviewed either through interrogatories or actual interviews, uh, and you could get back to us so we could be satisfied that these people who, to me, logically are part of the trail that has to be followed, have been followed. Uh, if you would send us a letter, I would be happy to, to forward that communications onto the Federal Reserve and FRBNY uh, and be happy to report back the, the, the responses. Okay. And then uh, last, if, uh, if we had gone through ordinary bankruptcy, obviously FP would not have made everybody whole unless the government threw the money in. But let me ask one final question. The individuals who received the greatest amount of these bonuses, the ones that really trigger our inquiry today, they negotiated basically paying 100 cents on the dollar. Where was the expertise in unwinding used to pay less than 100 cents on the dollar when, in fact, these products in their market, those who unloaded these products prior to getting 100 cents on the dollar, unloaded them for anywhere from a, a nickel or a dime up to maybe 40 cents on the dollar? Where was that expertise used, if anywhere? That is a, a tremendously important question, and we are going to be addressing it in an audit that we are going to be putting out next month that studies the, the counterparty payments and uh, the decision by the Federal Reserve to pay 100 cents on the dollar. Uh, so I look forward to, to, to sharing that audit with you and, and, of course, would be happy to come back and testify about that audit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. expired. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Borofsky, when did the last administration become aware of AIG bonus and retention plans? Was it before or after the $85 billion bailout? Uh, it would have been after the, the September bailout, the September uh, infusion of $85 billion from FRBNY. On page 11 of your audit report, you state that the New York Fed spent months after October 2008 influencing changes to future compensation decisions. Exactly what influence? did they have over AIG compensation decisions? And did the officials make the decisions for AIG? We are going to be studying that issue a lot more closely on, on corporate governance. It is an audit that we have pending right now. We are doing okay. in connection with GAO. It is going to really look at, at the government's role in, in, in making those types of governance decisions. Thank you. Now, during this period, did officials from the Federal Reserve use their influence to try and streamline AIG's compensation structure so it would be easier to understand and manage? Uh, yes, they worked with AIG to, with, it, with a consultant to get a, a better sense of what the entire structure was and, and advising AIG uh, to make a, a better, more comprehensible structure. During the testimony in front of the House Committee on Financial Services on March 24, 2009, Secretary Geithner and Chairman Bernanke both admitted that they had seen AIG's SEC filing and knew a great deal of information in the public domain regarding AIG's excessive bonus programs. However, neither of them claim to have known about the retention bonus plans for AIGFP employees until March 10, 2009. Now, have you examined AIG's SEC filing in early September 2008? And if so, were the retention bonus plans for AIGFP employees included in that filing? Um, generally speaking, I think that they, they would have been aware of, of those bonus plans. I think. Uh, the, the testimony was the, the specific size and scope of the, the, the amounts that went out in, on, in March of, of 2009, earlier this year. Well, then, given Mr. Geithner's heavy involvement in the bailout of AIG as the President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, 
Now, Mr. Barofsky, it's really hard to believe that he wasn't informed of the retention bonuses for AIGFP employees prior to March 10th, especially since they were awarded retention bonuses of $69 million in December 2008. Uh, was Mr. Geithner informed of the bonus plans? And if not, why not? I think we have, we have not seen evidence that, that he was informed of the size and scope of, of these retention plans. Um, as to the why not, um, I think that he should have been. I think it was a failure, again, as I said before, a failure of management. The one explanation that I would offer is the one I offered earlier, which is to a certain extent the Federal Reserve officials who are looking at this just didn't identify it as as significant an issue as it really was, and that may have contributed I, I, to them for their failure really to raise it up. I think it's important for members to uh, regard closely what Mr. Borofsky just said, because there's legislation in another committee that would give the Fed even broader jurisdiction in matters relating to the economy, and they can't even handle simple things like being able to keep track of bonuses that are going out the door at a time that they're uh, being asked and the Fed's being asked to pump money into the economy to prop up the AIGs of the world. Now, Mr. Borofsky, did you come across any information that would explain why these Federal Reserve Bank of New York officials did not immediately inform Mr. Geithner about the payments. Why didn't they tell him? What they explained to us was, was in substance, they didn't think it was such a big deal. $168 million was a drop in the bucket. Their concern, their focus was on repaying. Think about that bucket. No, it's a big bucket. Um, but their, their concerns were misplaced. I've, I mean, frankly, this was sort of the problem of the outsourcing of oversight to an entity that just doesn't have this political sensitivities, particularly at that time, that you would expect from Treasury, of, un, of, of looking at this not from just a dollars and cents of moving the beads on the abacus, uh, but of the more fundamental questions that, that, that we're addressing, which is, is it fair, is it right to give $198 million, uh, $168 million to the very individuals who are responsible for driving that company into the hole that it was that put it on the, the brink of bankruptcy. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Mr. Borofsky, the uh, Constitution of the United States makes it very clear that the uh, power to coin money and regulate the value thereof uh, is reserved to the Congress. Now, we gave that away in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, but we better look twice before we consider giving the Federal Reserve any more power, and we, we should also consider whether or not it's time for Congress to try to make up for some of the damage that was done to the American people by outsourcing our, uh, our, our money supply and, uh, and the, and the uh, supervision of it uh, to the Federal Reserve. They can't keep track of small matters, let alone large matters. Time for us to start thinking about changing the direction we have with that institution. I thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank, thank the gentleman from Ohio for his statement. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Tennessee. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, I agree with the comments that most of the people have made here today, Mr. Burton and Mr. Kucinich both, and, and I think there's widespread agreement, uh, and I think almost all the American people are just think these uh, uh, bonuses are, are ridiculously excessive. Uh, but uh, we're, we're talking today more specifically about the AIG bonuses, and, and the AIG bailout funds, according to the uh, timeline and sheet that uh, briefing that we've been given, totaled 180 billion. Is that correct? The total commitments add up to 180 billion. I mean, that's a mind-boggling figure that nobody can really humanly comprehend. But uh, uh, so, some, uh, several companies, several, some banks and companies have paid back some of the the bailout money. Do you know how many have paid back uh, who, uh, of the companies or the banks or the firms that got bailouts? Uh, the precise number will be in our, our quarterly report next week. I, I, I don't have the number at my fingertips. It's about $70 billion or so, uh, and I, but I don't remember the exact amount of, of what it is right now. How, how much of the $180 billion has AIG paid back? Well, I think the total amount that's outstanding, according to GAO's most recent report, is about $120 billion outstanding of the $180, $120 billion. And, and the, the bonuses that we're talking about, they, uh, they wanted to pay $243 million in bonuses. Is that correct? It's, uh, it's, for AIGFP, it was about, um, about $60 million in December, the $168 uh, that in this March, and another 198 that's due next March. 
So how much is that in total? It's a little bit over 400. 400. A little over $400 million. So it's total. $400 million. In, the, in, in one of our papers, it's, it, was, it was talking about just the $243 million. What, uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is the largest of those bonuses? How large are those bonuses? Um, I believe that they went up to $4 million for an individual. $4 million for an individual. And then in your report, it says that the, uh, uh, and the Treasury uh, uh, put down these rules and said the annual compensation limit of 500000 proposed by Treasury in February 2009 was not retained. That's correct. That's correct. And, uh, so, uh, and then bonus payments to senior executive officers um, are limited to one-third of total compensation. What is the... What is the highest compensation that's being received by uh, uh, AIG, somebody at AIG at this time? Uh, I'm not sure of AIG overall. I know recently um, the pay package for uh, the new CEO of, of AIG was recently approved, and I think that, that could be with incentives of up to $10 million. What's how much? With $10 million, $10 with, million? with various incentives, if, if he met, meets all his incentives. I think that's approximately the number. I don't have the number right before me. Well, I agree with all these others that these these bonuses, uh, uh, first of all, these bailout funds shouldn't have been uh, paid. We shouldn't have gone in this direction. But uh, even National Review Magazine had an editorial comment, that said, and they said that they ordinarily wouldn't be in favor of uh, the government being involved in the compensation of any private business. But when a business had accepted uh, a bailout money uh, that... Uh, uh, they f saw justification for limiting salaries and bonuses in that situation, and I certainly agree with that, and I think uh, about 99.9% .9 of the American people agree with that and, 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 and feel that these bonuses have been ridiculous and excessive. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen from uh, Tennessee. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Watson. Thank you much. Um, According to an article uh, in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, the moves made by Kenneth Feinberg, the Special Master for Compensation at the Treasury Department, to more clearly tie compensation to long-term performance are aimed squarely at salaries, not bonuses, which are restricted by rules passed by Congress earlier this year. Do you agree with the Wall Street Journal's assessment uh, that there is a legal differ differentiation between an executive salary and their bonuses and that uh, Kenneth Freeberg's uh, authority is limited only to their salary? Um, I think that his, I really d defer to his office for their, their, their current definition of their authority, uh, but I think that his his jurisdiction and scope is, is, is fairly broad. Uh, there are certain legal limitations that he's operating under. For example, uh, bonus programs or programs that were executed prior to February 11th are specifically exempted from the statute of being controlled by the, uh, the executive compensation restrictions that are in ESA as amended. Um, but with that said, there is amount of leverage that comes with being a, a significant equity owner of these, of these companies. Uh, and I think that Mr. Feinberg views his role broadly broadly and is uh, and it will be making advisory opinions that beyond just the scope of what's completely spelled out in the, in the statute. Mm. Uh, recent news reports have stated that uh, Mr. Feinberg is planning to shift a portion of an employee's annual salary into stock that cannot be accessed for several years to better tie pay to performance in the financial sector. However, some have made a counter argument that making stock a part of an executive's annual salary creates an incentive to boost the stock price in the short term, term rather than focus on long term shareholder value. Do you agree that tying compensation to stock will create this counter uh, intuitive short term um, incentive? I, I think a lot of that depends on the, the terms and conditions that are associated with the, with the bonus payment. I think that that is a legitimate concern, but perhaps it's one that can be addressed by the way the restrictions are spelled out. 
you know, when you, in your opening statement, you said it was a mess. These things are getting, that's why we were trying to get detail with it, because it is a mess. And as I said before, it's like trying uh, to unscramble rotten eggs. So uh, can you recommend any other guidance for how to structure compensation so that it encourages reasonable and sustainable work performance? I think, I think what, we'll, what we'll do and what we'll continue to do is to try to bring as much transparency to this process. Um, it is ultimately not our role to make, these, to make the policy decisions, uh, but it is our role to bring as much transparency to the decision-making process so that you, the policymakers in Congress and the policymakers in the executive, have all this information available to them to evaluate those decisions and tweak them, whether it is through different policies and procedures by, by Treasury or through legislation of this body, and we will we'll continue to fulfill that role. And according to your report, despite promises from AIG that they would attempt to recover some of the $165 million worth of bonuses paid in March, so far they have only recovered $19 million of the $45 million they ask recipients to repay. And apparently part of the problem is that uh, some employees resigned so they could keep their money instead of returning it. So can you explain why, if AIG was contractually obligated to pay the bonuses as part of uh, retention bonus plans agreed on in January 2008, the employees are not obligated to continue working for AIG in order to receive the extra money? Um, there are, in the agreements, there are, um, once, they, once they receive the retention payment, they can leave. Uh, and that would, mm -hmm. that if, if they quit, they wouldn't be able to receive the future retention payments uh, of 2010. However, if they are fired, and they are fired not for cause, uh, they still are actually entitled to receive retention payments, and approximately 50 or so of, of those who received the retention payments in March of, of this year uh, were not working at AIGFP at the time they received those payments because they fell into that category of people who had been fired but not for cause. So they are sticking to the contract whether then uh, the thoughts of trying to repay us who bailed them out uh, that money, the employees left, and so their performance is no longer uh, there for anyone to review, but they have the money and got away with it. That's correct. Uh, right. The gentlewoman's time has expired. <laughs> well, I will continue at another time. Thank <laughs> <Okay>. you. <laughs> and now I yield to five minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Borowski, thank you again for your testimony. Uh, we have seen a good bit of you as of late here in, on financial services as well, which I am a member of. Thank you for your frank and honest testimony. Um, you know, let's, let's rewind a little bit. Um, and I know the ranking member had some questions about who you interviewed in that whole process. Um, but it is clear you, you did not interview Secretary Geithner as a you know, our, my audit team interviewed Secretary Geithner uh, on, a, on a number of different audits. Um, I don't believe that they asked questions about this specific issue during that interview. Okay. Uh, did, did, uh, did your investigators um, interview Sarah Dahlgren, who, is the, uh, who was uh, Geithner's top bank supervisor at the New York Fed? Yes, we did. Yes. Extensively. Okay. Uh, were any questions posed to her whether or not her boss was informed of this? Yes. Uh, she informed us that she had not informed uh, then President Geithner. Okay. As head of the New York, pre then President of the New York Fed, yes. uh, Geithner. Um, was the Treasury staff, did they report that they uh, uh, provided then Secretary Geithner with this information? Not until March 10th. Not until March 10th. Okay, so it seems either a colossal failure of administration uh, through either error or omission uh, or willful ignorance in, in some cases. Um, and it seems to me that Secretary Geithner um, is a pivotal player here as both the head of the New York Fed, which had direct action, is that correct, with, yeah. with the AIG um, bailout? 
in the fall of last year. That's correct. That's correct. And he was a key decision maker um, in the uh, winter and spring of this year uh, about the AIG bonuses as well. Is that correct? Um, yes. He was clearly from the, the time at the president of FORBNY. There was a brief period of time where he recused himself from mm -hmm. matters from after uh, then-President-elect Obama identified him as the, the future Secretary of Treasury until he became Secretary of Treasury. He had recused himself from some of those matters. But other than that window, basically from September until the, president, until the present, in one job or the other, uh, he was the head of an organization that was involved in, in the ballot of AIG. Okay. Um, and uh, according to your report, um, the Treasury failed in its oversight of AIG compensation generally. Is that true? That's correct. Okay. Um, so it's kind of interesting to me, uh, as a part of an oversight panel, that we have, as Secretary of the Treasury, uh, someone who not only failed in his oversight uh, and actions about the bonuses as Secretary of the Treasury, but in his job immediately before that, and he did recuse himself uh, as of November 24th when the President nominated him, you're correct. But it also seems to me that he failed as head of the New York Fed uh, in terms of having oversight of this. In fact, it, these bonuses and the re these retention payments were a matter of public disclosure to the SEC uh, by, uh, by AIG. So it was in the public purview by then, was it not? I mean, yes, and I think much like if anything goes wrong in my organization, I'm responsible and it's my failure. Um, since we are criticizing both the Federal Reserve and the Treasury for failures of communication, management, and oversight, uh, of course he's ultimately responsible. Certainly. Well, I appreciate your frank, uh, frank testimony there. Um, and you've been a straight shooter all along, um, it, which I don't think is it's not a partisan issue. I mean, it, both parties are involved in this uh, chaos, it seems to me. Uh, but uh, additionally, you have uh, oversight over the PAYSAR, the, the Special Master uh, for Compensation, Ken Feinberg's operation. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, their operation in terms of, uh, uh, of reworking these retention bonuses, could that have a negative impact on the government's repayment of, of uh, funds from AIG? Uh, it is it is possible. Um, one could envision a scenario that if there really is one person who's so so important, so vital to underwinding these transactions, and has such a level of information, and a decision is made that results in that person leaving, uh, it is theoretically possible. Now, whether those facts are true or whether it will play out that way, I I don't know. I'm not in a position to say, but it is certainly at least theoretically possible. Does your office uh, have a plan uh, for oversight? Uh, of this uh, PAYSAR and their operations? We have a number of audits under consideration as we staff up. Uh, one of them that I have certainly have discussed with my audit staff is will be an audit of the, uh, of the PAYSAR. We are not announcing it yet. We want to sort of see what happens uh, and that way we can better structure the audit, make sure that we ask the right questions and, and, and do it in a correct way. Uh, but I do anticipate that we will be auditing that process almost certainly. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. The gentleman's time has expired. And now you have five minutes to the gentlewoman from Washington, D.C., Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for these important follow-up hearings on this matter of great concern to this committee. Um, uh, sir, I am um, uh, intrigued by the legal basis uh, for your conclusion that uh, AIG was required by law uh, to distribute these bonuses. Now, I, my concern comes from um, uh, not only my own um, um, my own uh, s specific concern, but one that has al also been voiced by the Attorney General of the State of New York, Andrew Cuomo. Understand that I am trained as a lawyer to uh, respect the sanctity of contract. So I don't ask this question lightly. But nor I think did uh, did Andrew Cuomo <laughs> ask it lightly, and he apparently sent a letter to uh, the chairman of, um, of financial services, uh, Mr. Frank, in which he takes on your conclusion uh, that these bonuses were legally required. 
I could not help but smile at uh, a line in his letter uh, that he wondered whether AIG attorneys, quote, considered the argument that it is only by the grace of the American taxpayers that members of financial products even have jobs. Now, I, I was intrigued by uh, Attorney General Cuomo's um, analysis, and I wonder if you considered uh, his uh, arguments uh, before um, before um, drawing your own conclusions. For example, uh, AIG, which by contract apparently uh, was to pay people certain salaries, uh, they seem not to have had trouble renegotiating those salaries, which surely didn't weren't orally uh, pronounced. They renegotiated those contracts, but when it came to uh, these retention bonuses, the law didn't allow uh, such renegotiation or change. And I wonder if you could um, indicate uh, your view of these arguments, that some of which uh, are in Mr. Cuomo's uh, correspondence. Sure. I, I think there's, there's two different parts here. Uh, first is whether this was a legally binding contract. And you know, based on uh, what we report on is the, the different legal opinions that Treasury received uh, for AIG counsel, from its own counsel, uh, from Department of Justice. Yeah, I, I, I know the conclusion, okay. sir. No, no. And may I continue? Um, the second part of your question, which is a far different one, was, well, could they have renegotiated? And I think the answer to that question was, is, of course they could have renegotiated. Um, they could Should have they have? I think the fact that right now they, I will answer that question by what's going on right now, which is, Basically, Mr. Uh, Mr. Feinberg is encouraging them to renegotiate, and they, as we detail in our audit, they are. Well, should they have renegotiated? You know, this is what caused outrage. This is what is making it hard for more funds to come through here. Let's let's hope we don't have another um, uh, rolling crisis here. Right, and I think that's. Uh, and the if they're doing that now, does that not indicate that they should have renegotiated these bonuses rather than arguing that by law they had to, they had to pay them? Because if by law they don't have to pay them now, how could they have by law had to pay them then? And, and I think your point is, 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 is very well made, especially when you look at the bailout in context. And certain times we say contracts are inviolable and, and this is a binding legal contract and therefore it has to be, to be followed. But if you look at it in context with other parts of the bailout, whether the auto industry, uh, whether it's contracts with, with auto dealers or contracts with, with debt holders. Sometimes contracts are, are compelled to be renegoti renegotiated and terms are changed. So I, I think you, your concern is right and, and shouldn't, should not um, confuse our, our finding that while this was indeed a binding contract, there was an offer and consideration and performance, uh, the three elements of any contract, that's not to say that that was the correct move to just say that this is a binding legal contract, here's your check, thank you very much. That, that's not our conclusion at all. And what I is your conclusion? I mean, I, I don't know why you would simply have endorsed their conclusion that, well, these were legally binding contracts and then you cite others who found those contracts. I want you to know that American people say, are you crazy? Would these people, for example, have had any bonuses? Had they lost their jobs? Uh, which they retain by, by the grace of the, ta of the taxpayers. So uh, you, you, your answer seems to, to be that, yes, they could have renegotiated them. I don't know why that wasn't your conclusion in the report, uh, the, the so that people would have understood that there's real oversight going on here, that there were alternatives, that people losing their jobs and their bonuses here uh, can expect that people in high places uh, who had their money would also be required to do so. Uh, our conclusions, I think, make pretty clear, and we point out that, first of all, we were asked the question, we answer the question, was this a legally binding contract? And the answer to that question is based on the, the, these various people that it is. But the question that you're asking is why didn't we suggest were there alternatives? The answer is that we, we do in our audit. Uh, we specifically note one opportunity that was lost as far as government leverage was the fact that $30 billion more of taxpayer money was coming down the pike in March of 2009. And this would have been an opportunity to go back 
and compel renegotiation. So, so I think and that, that I, leverage, I, that leverage which was in the hand of management, yeah. <laughs> so was I, not used in behalf of the taxpayers. Yes, and I think that your concerns are addressed in our audit report. We do report, as we were required to do, on the, the basic legality of whether or not there was a contract. But I think our audit makes clear that just because that was, it was a legally binding contract didn't mean that there were not other alternatives available to AIG and the Federal Government that, were, that didn't take place and that these options are still on the table and, and are being pursued with respect to the next tranche of payments in March of 2010. Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would um, like to just echo the frustration of the delegate from the Federal District over uh, how a lot of this was handled. I guess we just got to be reminded this is exactly um, the problem with big government thinking that we are going to use that to hold big business accountable and the taxpayer and the little guy seems to get stomped in the in, in long run. And so I, I do echo the, the delegate's uh, frustration there. Um, at this time, Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield my uh, time to uh, the ranking member from California. I, I thank the gentleman. You know, uh, your, your oversight and your, your testimony time and time again are, are critical and, and sometimes the most critical part is, is when we revisit what you previously had been working on and perhaps not satisfied. The last time you were before us, you had deep concerns and had uh, in your previous report and uh, particularly as to the public-private invest investment program. Uh, and, I, and particularly as to the absence of a firewall and self-dealing, uh, including, uh, I guess, BlackRock, uh, who was, is being paid on one side and can still invest on the other. Have changes been implemented so that your, those concerns are less? And if so, could you tell us how? Um, overall, no. Uh, there, there have been some changes. We are going to detail them in our, our report that is coming out next week. But Walls have not been implemented. So self-dealing is still possible with taxpayers' money. It's it's an extreme risk, uh, and with absent these ethical walls, it, it maintains a, a a strong risk um, that we're going to be paying very careful attention to. Uh, have you reviewed uh, Secretary Paulson's uh, telephone records that have now been released? I I personally have not. Uh, well, we, we looked at them briefly, and, and what we discovered was that uh, his phone logs show that he was talking to, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Secretary Geithner a great deal, but also to uh, now President Barack Obama. It appears from those records as though the transition had occurred by November, that in fact the majority of the, the calls were being made to the incoming uh, uh, incoming uh, administration, not to the outgoing. Would that surprise you? Those events occurred before uh, before I was even sworn in. So, uh, well, but, I, I but really you're looking, don't. but you're now looking back on who knew what and when did they know it and 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 how were the mistakes continue to be made? Is that an area that you think is within your purview to continue looking at? Oh, if it's related to a specific TARP issue, absolutely. Um, we saw no indication that uh, that anyone at Treasury, including Secretary Paulson, knew about these AIG bonus payments. You know, at, at at that time, so that it that wouldn't okay. have been part of this audit, but it it's certainly within the scope of, of potential future audit products. Absolutely. Now I want to follow up on what uh, Delegate Norton had said because I think what she she hit on in your answer needs one more, if you will, f uh, filling out. Even though there's billions of dollars more coming from the federal government, don't we at the day as have a if you will a self fulfilling prophecy? We've determined at that time this is too big to fail and the government will put any and all money in necessary. So if, if the government did not put in more money at the time when they could have used it as leverage, if they said, look, if we don't get negotiated down cost, we are not going to put the money in, wouldn't that basically have said, you go into bankruptcy if you don't do it? And didn't the employees basically all know that that was a false statement if we, if we had made it? that we, we had written a blank check. We had given the President and the Fed walking around money that was virtually unlimited. I, I think that's, th there is certainly a lot to that statement. Uh, I do think there is a tremendous amount of leverage when you are going to be continued to make uh, additional payments and, and put in conditions. And I think a good example of that is in the auto industry, where the Federal Government through the TARP had made billions and billions of dollars of support to Chrysler and to, to General Motors. Uh, but then went back with the threat of bankruptcy to force very significant concessions. Right. But in that case, of course, we ultimately put them in bankruptcy after we would had the political bankruptcy. And uh, I know that is not within your direct testimony today, 
But isn't it true basically that we put money in that we'll never get back in a political bankruptcy before the actual bankruptcy w uh, occurred or, if you will, the sale of Chrysler to Fiat and the, uh, uh, the whole uh, re refunding of, of General Motors? I, I share your skepticism about the likelihood of getting the, the, that money back, the early money back. And, and by the way, just as an old car guy, do you actually think that Fiat has technology that, uh, that uh, the Chrysler didn't have? Uh, that is well without beyond the scope of uh, any current audit product that Thank we have. Thank you, but I figured uh, it, it, it was worth a smile. Thank you. Let's yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for being here, Mr. Borowski. Thank you. Um, for the, uh, uh, the, the better part of the year, uh, it has been painfully evident uh, to the American people that AIG has been due an audit. Um, after using taxpayer dollars to bail out an insurance company that was once the largest in the country and possibly in the world, uh, AIG used those same taxpayer dollars to reward the culprits of its corporate collapse. Uh, we cannot afford to be frivolous uh, with hard-earned income of our citizens. Um, following the de decline of AIG's stock value in 07, uh, employee compensation packages were adjusted to account for the loss in value of existing plans. Uh, these changes reflect AIG's ability to, to negotiate compensation benefits with its employees and suggest that AIG could have done the same in light of its federal assistance. Uh, why did bonuses and retention awards continue to be included in compensation packages even after AIG received a federal bailout from the pockets of American taxpayers? Why did that persist? You know, that, that is a, a vitally important question. Uh, the explanations that we have received that we report in our, in our audit um, was essentially the was, was what we have heard, which is this, this notion of the sanctity of the contract. But I could not agree more with, with, with your statement that, of course, there was an opportunity to renegotiate these agreements both, both then and as is going on right now. Uh, according to your findings, the uh, 2008 bonus plan for senior partners was restructured in, in, in October of last year. According to this new plan, a portion of the bonuses would be paid only if the company had been sufficiently reorganized, progressed in repaying federal monies and cut the 08 bonus pool by 30 percent. Uh, how many of these stipulations were met? I'm not sure how many of those stipulations have, had actually been met on, on that issue. That's outside the AIG FP issue, but on mm -hmm. the, the, TARP, uh, the TARP bonus structures. I think, though, a lot of those rules and restrictions have been superseded uh, by ARA and by the mid-June uh, Treasury regulations, and I think that the decisions about the, the pay plans for the top 100 employees at AIG are going to be determined by Mr. Feinberg. Um, but I will I can follow up and, and, and get can more you, information and, on that. And could you tell us how much of the $150 billion Federal Rescue Package has been, has been repaid? Right now, the current amount outstanding to AIG is about $120 billion. I see. Um, I see. Um, re retention payments to AIGFP. What justification has AIG given regarding the paying retention awards to the FP div division, uh, the division central to AIG's demise? The, the two arguments that have been advanced are, one, again, that this was a, a binding legal agreement and therefore they were compelled to do so. Um, the second argument is that employees at AIGFP, uh, some of them were essential because of their unique knowledge to unwinding the complex transactions that, that, that occurred. Uh, as noted earlier, um, neither one of these arguments is, is entirely satisfying. Yeah, and, and then, I mean, it, it even got to the absurdity of uh, retention awards being paid to non-essential staff, including almost $8,000 to a kitchen assistant and 7000 to a mailroom assistant. What was the justification for that? 
um, we still have, we're still waiting to get our justification for that. I think, again, that falls back into the first point that these were legally required uh, under contract is, is the justification. Again, it's, it's not one that we share or find particularly satisfying, but that's the explanation. Were, were the retention programs successful in retaining these employees? Um, certainly there are a number, uh, there's still AIG FP employees, uh, whether or not they're there, still there because of these retention payments or because of the realities of the job market or maybe the realities of having AIG FP on your resume may not make you the most attractive potential employee. Uh, it's difficult to determine. Can you share with the committee uh, how many resigned despite receiving a retention award? Um, I don't have that number right, right handy, but it's a number I'm sure we can find would out. You sh would you get it to us, please? I, I thank you for your response, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much. And I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Borofsky, for your testimony today. It's very compelling. I uh, appreciate your, uh, your thoroughness. Just kind of curious, I know that in the uh, stimulus package, we, uh, I think it was Senator Dodd, at the request of someone in the administration, put in there the uh, continued authorization to pay these bonuses. Is that not correct? The, I think the provision you're referring to is the one that made it so that uh, any agreement that had been signed prior to February 11 of 2009 uh, would not be subject to the error restrictions that were later incorpor that were incorporated into ESA. Okay. So that's that, uh, that is correct. That part. Why do you under, is, do you have any information as to why that would have been in there? Do they did they need that in order to be able to pay these bonuses legally, or was there concern on their part that they would not that they're not legal otherwise? Uh, so they put this in there. Or? I'm not familiar with the, the legislative intent of, of why that provision was put in there. Okay. Did it have any impact on your audit? Uh, it had an impact to the extent that it really, it made it very clear that these were, these would have been exempt and carved out of any of the ESA restrictions. Okay. So, okay, so in other words, it emphasized the fact that they wanted to make, make these bonuses available or, or, or be able to be paid to their executives. Is that correct? There would be no TARP restriction on, okay. uh, on making these payments. Um, what, what's the percentage right now that the government actually owns of AIG? You said 80 percent. Is that still 80 percent? It's, it's slightly under 80 percent. Okay. Uh, since we the people own that, do we have a representative on this board of directors? We have, um, right now the government's ownership interest is managed by uh, trustees, three, three independent trustees. Are they represented on the board of directors? I think they advise the board of directors. I don't know if they're actually on the board of directors. So we don't have representation on a board that we own 80 percent of? I, yeah, I think that's correct. I think we do not have, the government does not have representatives on the board of directors. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I can find out. Why, why do we not have representatives on the board of directors? I think the decision was made to manage the government's interest through these trustees instead. Okay. But I, again, I'm not sure we don't have uh, representatives on the board of directors, but I'll find out. Um, okay. And, and right now we have a gentleman, uh, Mr. Feingold, who is, uh, or Feinberg, who is the PAYSAR who is going to oversee the, uh, the payment of future bonuses, is that correct? Yes, that's true. What, what authority does he have to do that? Where does he get his authority from? Uh, his authority is, is basically arises out of, of ARA, which we were discussing earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and the Treasury regulations that were issued uh, resulting out of ARA, which set forth the executive compensation restrictions and set forth this procedure for, for Mr. Feinberg, so it ultimately draws from the statute. So they supersede any contractual obligations that AIG might have with its employees? Well, that, that, is, that is going to be one of the challenges that Mr. Feinberg uh, has because, no, it would not. For example, it wouldn't uh, trump these retention pro the future retention payments that are due in March of 2010. ARA still exempts those uh, from, f from ESA's restrictions. Uh, AIG has asked for and he can provide a advisory opinion on them, um, but ultimately uh, those are, those remain to be binding contracts. Um, but of course he can make recommendations. Uh, he can take into account past compensation, making future compensation decisions. So we'll we really haven't solved the problem yet if we have a PAYSAR who can't, doesn't have the authority to oversee the bonuses and we don't have a representative on the board of directors who can direct that these recommendations be taken seriously. Is that, that a fair assessment? Um, it may very well be. I think that, that my understanding is from statements AIG has made, made to us and as they say publicly uh, that they're working very closely with Mr. Feinberg and uh, I certainly we're all hopeful that the AIG will, <laughs> will, will follow those recommendations. Uh, if okay, not, I'm, take, I'm sure I they'll take be that here. that as an affirmation of my statement. 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, very quickly, uh, as my time expires here, uh, you've made a couple recommendations uh, in your report, and we're just kind of curious as to uh, whether uh, Treasury has implemented those. Uh, one is uh, that Treasury continues to hide information about the value of assets in its portfolio. Um, have, have they started coming clean? Have they started to uh, make um, more available, more transparent what the, their assets are and the value of those assets? No, they're going to be um, publishing as part of uh, GAO's annual financial statement for, for the TARP. Uh, they'll be publishing under the Credit Reform Act uh, valuations of the portfolio. Uh, and that's a, an annual process. Uh, they have not adopted our recommendation of sharing with the American people their internal valuations they receive on a monthly basis. Um, I've scheduled a meeting with them actually tomorrow. Uh, they're going to give us a briefing on their justifications and explanations uh, as we continue to press for that, to, for that recommendation to be adopted. Now, you've made several recommendations in your report. What do you feel in your estimation is the most important recommendation that, that you could make and have they, have, have whoever you need to be able to, 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 to address it, have they addressed it and are they, if they have, fine, if they haven't, why not? I think it, it's difficult to say because each TARP program is different, but I think our biggest overarching recommendations which relate to transparency uh, in particular on requiring TARP recipients to report on how they are using their TARP funds uh, is, is fundamentally important for a number of reasons, including it, it, it fuels a lot of the cynicism. The failure to adopt this recommendation, I think, fuels a lot of the cynicism that the American people have towards this program, this perception that the TARP is a black hole. Uh, I think it's a very unfortunate uh, decision on Treasury's part. It's a decision that was made by the last administration and continues with this administration, uh, and it's one that we, we continue to press for. But I think that's one of the most significant failings because it's indicative of a basic attitude towards transparency that we find is lacking in the, in the TAR program. I appreciate Gen your remarks. Time, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your time has expired. Thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to the uh, gentlewoman from Ohio. Ms. Capture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Borofsky. Thank you, Thank you for your work. Uh, could you please restate for the record, to the best of your ability, how much taxpayer money has been put at risk through the funding of the TARP at Treasury and also any estimate you might have of the dollars that have been put at risk through the Fed, which total into the trillions, I am told. Can you clarify that for the record? Sure. I don't have those numbers at, at my fingertips right now. In our, our last audit report, we put out an estimate of the total amount of money that was, that was um, related to the financial crisis outstanding, and in that we, we totaled it to be approximately $3 trillion uh, across the Federal Government, and we had breakdowns with the Federal Reserve and Treasury uh, in, in that quarterly report. I don't, I don't have those numbers at my fingertips, but, but they are reflected in that report. All right. I thank you. You know, I am in awe and simultaneously in utter disgust at how Wall Street and the money elites in our country take care of one another to the point of wrapping their tentacles around the entire Federal Government of the United States of America. That takes a lot of power. Uh, we have 15 million people unemployed. We have millions and millions of people being kicked out of their homes. And yet we witness this egregious behavior by those who continue to receive these bonuses and really an arrogant disregard for the Republic and its citizenry. In your testimony on page 16, you accurately state that the plans for these bonuses at AIG and AIG's financing um, a risk division were exempted, exempted under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act this year, which explicitly stated that it did not apply to agreements on bonuses in place prior to February 11, 2009. Who could have had the power? to insert that provision, I am going to ask your staff to please provide for the record the exact language of the provision that did that in the Recovery Act. Um, and I would like you to venture an opinion on who drafted that language and how did it get in that major recovery bill, which included our unemployment benefit extensions, it included the Medicaid payments to the States. Uh, people can disagree whether they like the Recovery Act or not, but to have that provision in there, it wasn't in the House bill. How did that get in there? My understanding is that Senator Dodd introduced the amendment that, that reflects that language. Um, and basically, what is the net effect of that language? The net effect of that language is that the TARP does not prohibit these types of bonus payments that the um, 
if the bonus plan was offered prior to that date. That's unbelievable that this could happen in our country um, and that members of Congress uh, and to the extent that your staff can provide the exact way in which this happened legislatively through committee, through subcommittee, however, through conference committee, um, I would be very grateful if you could provide it for the record. Um, let me ask you this question. Um, do you believe that these unwarranted bonuses could have been prevented and prior bonuses clawed back if our government established through a civil lawsuit or through administrative enforcement actions or criminal prosecution that the bonuses were prompted by accounting fraud, could we open it up? I am trying to, to go back to my, my, my days as a prosecutor just a year ago of, of, of forfeiture and issues. There certainly are circumstances uh, if these, these payments were resulting from fraud that there, there could be opportunities for, for forfeiture or, or restitution. Um, All right. I'm trying to think of the, the specific circumstances, but it certainly is, is possible. All right. That's an important statement for the record, because I think justice has to be won through the courts to the extent that we can, and they can't be on the sidelines in this, and parties to this suit should be thinking about that, uh, because the American people, the American people don't support this. And yet this is going on, and it has been made the law of the land. I think most members of Congress, if you surveyed them, don't even realize that that provision was in the recovery bill uh, that was passed earlier this year. Uh, and, and it takes a lot of power to, to insert a provision like that that literally puts the wall, firewall up against us going after those bonuses. And to be clear, as, as, I, as the wheels keep turning, I think what we would probably need to show is an individual employee who participated in a type of fraud that resulted and in, in, in included into the, the bonus payment. It may be more difficult to, to claw back under a fraud theory um, someone who is a participant to the contract uh, and fulfill their obligations under the contract and receive the payment. Uh, that person may be more difficult to recover. But if, if one of the recipients of the bonuses was involved in a fraud that helped lead to those, uh, I think there, there would, be, uh, would be legal remedies. If the gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentlewoman's time has expired. Could I ask the gentleman to provide one piece of information you know, I mean, for the, the problem is we are having a vote, and I am afraid that some of the members might not have an opportunity to. Uh, that is my problem. So, Congressman Welch. Uh, thank you. I will be brief. Uh, thank you very much for your, your good work. Uh, and I just want to make a brief statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think all of us are deeply troubled by AIG's unwillingness to live up to its clear obligation to return millions in bonuses that are totally unwarranted. Those should be returned to the American taxpayer. Uh, the Special Investigator General's report lays bare the troubling extent to which AIG continues to take advantage of the United States government and the United States taxpayer. They acted in good faith last fall when the company's looming collapse posed a systemic risk to the entire U.S. economy. But the folks in AIG's Financial Products Division who helped push our economy off a cliff don't deserve a diamond bonuses that are financed by the American taxpayer. And I continue to urge the Department of Treasury and the Federal Reserve to work together to recoup this money and ensure that AIG honors its commitments and that we honor our obligation to the U.S. taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman for his statement. I now yield to Congressman Murphy from Connecticut. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I want to get back to the issue of, of retention for a moment. But um, before I do, in follow-up to Representative uh, Kaptur's questions, the language that regarding the contractual obligations of, of bonuses in um, legislation inserted in the Senate. Um, just to be clear, this, that language was in the context of an amendment that limited uh, the awarding of bonuses to companies that received uh, TARP and Federal uh, rescue funds. Oh, yes. I mean, the, the error restrictions, which significantly increased the uh, executive compensation restrictions on TARP recipients, in the original version of the statute, they were, they were, were much milder, to put it, to put it mildly. Um, but this was all part of an amendment that included um, far greater restrictions, which 
ultimately created the, the PAYSAR and the bonus restrictions that ultimately have been incorporated into ESA. That's correct. In, in the context of the amendment offered by Senator Dodd in the Senate that was not part of the, the House version initially. Yes, yeah, Senator Dodd's amendment was, was related to the, the entire executive compensation structure uh, was 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 all authored by, by Senator Dada. If I didn't make that clear, I, I perhaps should have. That that was his proposal to put into into ESA through ARA the ex enhanced executive compensation restrictions, and part of that was was this provision. That's correct. I, I want to uh, come back to this issue of um, bonuses offered to retain employees. This is a key part of your report and um, uh, part of what you feel was missed in the discussions between Treasury and AIG was the lack of, uh, of, of real solid questioning as to, the, um, uh, as to some of uh, the um, declarations made by AIG. And one of the things you say in your report uh, to start with is that the resignations at AIG FP have been, I think you used the word, particularly acute um, uh, over the course of this time period. Um, because this is such an important piece of the justification, I'm wondering if you can drill down a little bit on that and what leads you to uh, the, um, uh, the supposition that resignations have been particularly acute at AIG FP. It, it basically, the numbers. Uh, I don't have the specific numbers right in front of me, but uh, but AIG has reported that there's been a, a large number of resignations. Um, you know, the reasons for them could be multifold. Uh, I'd hate to speculate. Certainly, it's been reported to us that all of the attention that occurred in March, uh, and you know, there's been anecdotal uh, stories of people going to AIG executive, uh, AIG FP executives' houses. There's bus tours that that stop at their houses. Obviously, that that creates a lot of pressure. Um, also, the business is one of winding down, um, and it's it's not the, the and because of the very poor financial performance of, of the entity, that too could contribute to, to why people would leave. Um, How do we going forward try to get at this issue to make sure that this doesn't happen again? You've, I think, correctly laid out uh, all sorts of reasons that, that people m may leave, uh, many having nothing to do with pay or compensation packages, and lots of reasons that people would stay having nothing to do with paying compensation packages given the existing market. As, as we try to chart a course forward here, how do you suggest that, that, that Treasury um, or this Congress evaluate these claims that AIG or any other company may make that they must pay a million, five million, ten million in bonus money in order to keep uh, an employee, given all of those competing factors? Um, what's your suggestions as, as, to, as to how we evaluate this going forward? I, I think the key to any type of policy or procedure that addresses your question must be that it be formalized and be transparent. Uh, because I think that where, where the, the biggest problems occur is when the types of, of, of dealings or, or transactions or dealings or advice are given uh, behind the curtain. Uh, that creates the cynicism and anger that we've seen relating to this bailout um, and that, that pervades a lot of the TARP. So I think that what the actual what the actual policies and procedures are, uh, that's a more difficult question. That's something for Treasury uh, as the policymaker to determine and for this, this body. But the structure, I, I think, is, is key. I, um, I, guess we need your, I guess we need your help on that, though, because you know, transparency is wonderful, but if, if, they're, if, if all they're saying is, is a restatement of their claim that they must pay $10 million in bonuses in order to keep this employee, Having that claim be transparent um, it doesn't really help us much. It's hard for me to understand, as I think it is for many on this committee and in this Congress, to understand um, why these bonuses were merited, given the fact that there weren't a lot of job opportunities out there for the very people that were responsible for the collapse of, of, of that company. So I, I just ask you going forward um, to help us try to chart those standards, help us uh, come up with recommendations for Treasury so that we're not just reliant on the transparency piece, that we actually have um, some standards in place to guarantee that this isn't just a claim of retention, um, that there's actually merit behind that claim. And I thank you, uh, the Chairman, for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen from Connecticut. Uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to use my, uh, yield my five minutes to uh, my distinguished ranking member, Mr. Issa. I thank the Chairman. And, and I'm sorry, it, uh, it seems like all my folks are being real shy today, but uh, Perhaps, uh, perhaps it's just my day to be tough on you. Uh, I'm going to try and bring a close to this, uh, uh, this hearing with, with a tough question. Sure. 
Your testimony previously and now is that uh, then Fed Chair New York Fed Chairman Geithner didn't know about the bonuses while well, he was New York Fed Chairman, even though it was his responsibility to oversee the, uh, that failed uh, uh, AIG and, of course, the, the funds that went to them. Isn't that correct? We haven't seen any indication that he knew. Okay, yeah. So we don't know if he knew, but it was his job to know, and so far he said, he's testified he didn't know. He said he didn't know, and we, we haven't seen any indication to come. Okay. So according to his testimony, he failed to know when it was his job to know. Yes. And as Treasury Secretary, he failed to stop, even though he had at least a couple of days' notice, he failed to stop these bonuses and, and has said he, he just couldn't, right? That's correct. So he failed to, failed to know when he should have known. He failed to stop when this committee on a bipartisan basis say, says he should have at least halted it for a review and, and not simply paid it. And now he's failing to give you transparency, you've testified, right? That is correct. So we have a Secretary of the Treasury who failed to know what he should have known, failed to do what he should have done, and has failed to give us transparency. That's really what this testimony today is all about. And, uh, and in fact, on a bipartisan basis, we're hearing that, one, we're not getting transparency, and two, even if we get transparency, if we can't trust the judgment and the decisions of the Treasury, then in fact we're not going to get the outcome the American people expect us to get, and we're going to continue to have non-essential people paid huge bonuses in many cases that, uh, that are unnecessary with, with taxpayers' dollars or dollars that could be returned to taxpayers. That is correct, isn't it? There is a, a lot of in your statement, a lot of which I agree with. Okay. Uh, well, we won't ask for the minute part you may not, just, may not agree with. So I guess this committee is dealing with a, a Treasury who is not providing transparency to the IG who has called for it and, in fact, this is a, a gentleman who was confirmed by the Senate. Uh, nominated by the President to be part of the most transparent, the, I repeat, the most transparent uh, administration in history. And I, I'm sure you've heard that uh, claim by the administration, right? And, and much more importantly than being transparent to, to us, uh, it's the transparency to the American people, the taxpayers who are the investors in this program. Um, they've been, you know, they, they've been good as far as giving us the documents and information that we've requested, but as far as bringing the, the necessary transparency to the program, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So, Mr. Chairman, when we said that we wanted to go everywhere that the trail leads and to all people, uh, I, would, I would say today, and, and I am not calling on you to do this, but I am suggesting that, that you and I work on a bipartisan basis to be, bring Secretary Geithner here to, in fact, review thoroughly what appears to be a pattern of not knowing, not stopping, and now not providing the transparency that the President has tasked him uh, to provide. I think that the IG has been, I don't want to say timid, but he has certainly been respectful as he has delivered this message. But if the summary of that message that we have all heard is correct, then I believe that it is now time for us to bring a Secretary Geithner here to find out if, in fact, he will make a change in direction of the large uh, ship of state, the Treasury Department, to make them provide the transparency that the President tasked him to do. Uh, I, uh, I told you it would be tough. You are still standing, so it couldn't have been that tough. I want to thank you, though, for, uh, for your testimony here today. I want to thank you for your respectful candor in delivering what is not what we like to hear. We don't like to hear that the administration doesn't have it right yet. And I think both sides of the aisle have, uh, have uh, worked with you to point that out. I thank you for this. I would, in closing, uh, ask if you can look through your schedule and if possibly we, I'm assuming we won't do another hearing this soon, but I know you're releasing additional information next week. If your schedule allows, I think we would like to try to arrange for uh, a less formal, maybe a one hour uh, with the members uh, so that we could get briefed and, and have a quick discussion so we would understand what you're releasing next week, if you can see if that's available. Oh, any time will always be available for, for, for that, of course. Thank you, and I would like to thank Mr. Schock for yielding that, time. And I'd yield the I, I'm sure he would yield the balance to the Chairman. Yeah, no, without objection, uh, we would um, love to arrange a joint briefing, you know, um, and of course, I uh, hope that we can do that. Um, not a hearing, but a briefing of, the, of all the members. Uh, let me just uh, uh, close on this note by saying that uh, thank you very much, uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Borowski, for uh, your being here, and we really appreciate the work that you're doing. A year ago, with major Wall Street firms either bankrupt or teetering on the edge, 
House Speaker Nancy Pelosi famously said, the party is now over. And for AIG, that was true. Only a massive taxpayer bailout has kept AIG alive. Yet, despite the fact the mismanagement and poor business decisions brought the company down, AIG's executives still insist on extraordinary compensation. At AIG, the party might be over, but the music hasn't stopped playing and the musicians keep hanging around. Uh, on the, one of the things we've learned today is that apparently AIG's executives still believe that millions of dollars in bonuses or retention payments or whatever you want to call them should be paid to them without regards to the company's performance. In other words, they don't want to look at performance. They want to just sort of say, this is the way we do it. We've been doing it for years and we're going to continue to do it. In other words, not much has changed since last spring. Now the special master, Ken Feinberg, is reviewing AIG's latest proposal for nearly $200 million in bonuses. The Wall Street Journal today says he is having trouble convincing AIG to reduce those payments. He has his hands full. We will hear directly from him two weeks from now at our second hearing on executive compensation. Finally, I want to thank you, Mr. Borowski, uh, who I think is doing a fine job in looking into these important issues. I think it is particularly important for Congress to have the facts in hand on these important issues before we act on financial regulatory reform. And I thank you, Mr. Varosky, in terms of making this significant contribution in, that, in this regard. You know, I want to thank, again, the members for uh, attending uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, this very, very important hearing. Um, finally, please let the record demonstrate my submission of a binder with documents relating to this hearing. And of course, without objections, I entered this binder into the committee records. And without objections, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you. We've learned today that a Democratic member of Congress will be stepping down. Democratic Congressman Robert Wexler has announced that he'll leave Congress in January to become president of the Center for Middle East Peace. The Florida Democrat in his seventh term in the U.S. House, representing the 19th congressional district in that state. Well, this afternoon, a Senate subcommittee will be looking at the state of the financial industry. We'll hear testimony from Sheila Baer, chairman of the Federal Department.